Michael, a pleasure to have you as a guest on our interview series and congratulations on building such a successful and diverse array of career experiences. I thought we'd begin by getting an understanding of your view on the economy, particularly given the uncertainty that's been experienced over the past 20 or so months. Thanks, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, the economy is um, interesting whether you're looking at it here within Australia or obviously we're impacted by global events as well. I think what we've seen is around the world the response by governments to the fiscal stimulus that they applied very quickly as COVID broke last year and then continuing this year here in Australia in, in a measured way has really uh, mitigated some of the real downsides that could have come out of COVID. But it does mean that there's going to be a bumpy recovery as, as we come back. So expect to see surges as we've seen in certain sectors. I believe that we're still going to see an impact on COVID going forward for a number of months, probably going into 2022. And that will cause pullbacks and, and the like and companies having to adjust with to that depending on what sector they're in. But overall, I think you're going to be seeing a, a good recovery. Uh, as there is all this pent up demand, uh, particularly on the consumer side of things that starts flowing through, but it will be lumpy as supply chains uh, adjust to these rapid increase in volumes. You look at what we're seeing in California at the moment with all of these container ships sort of offshore waiting to dock, and I think that's just emblematic of what you'll see throughout, particularly the Western world, as, as we get back to a new normal. In general terms, and you did touch on it there, what do you see are the tailwinds for companies looking toward the remainder of this year and into next year? Well, it is very much that pent-up demand, the, the benefits of the fiscal stimulus. Uh, so, the, you know, by and large, the consumer is cashed up and just looking for things to do at the moment, very much on a domestic front because of the lack of ability to travel. And you're seeing that play through, and I think that will play through very much for the next six months. But then that will flow through into longer term sectors like investment uh, on a residential side. You know, you'll start to see that coming more into a stability across all sectors and happy to expand on that. But I think by and large, those are the tailwinds, that huge demand that's been waiting to get out there and get satisfied is going to come through. Conversely, take me through what you see are the major headwinds for companies looking towards next year and beyond? Firstly, responding to that demand, so particularly around labour, and we're hearing a lot of that here in Australia around labour shortages. Um, you've had the issues right from the sort of bottom of the uh, labour chain from student labour that would be here normally with international students, uh, the more permanent migration coming in, fueling sort of skilled, skilled jobs, so I think there's going to be a real issue, and that's what I'm hearing around all of my network, is just the challenge of getting sufficient skilled labour, and then the fact that there's just been through COVID, I think it's caused a lot of people to just rethink their lives, and they're looking for a change. They're looking for a change of scenery, and, and that's causing them to think, maybe I, I'll go off for a different career or to a different company, and people are completely changing their careers and, and you know, the catchphrase is the great resignation. And that's not necessarily anything to do with the company per se, but it's just the psych psychological effect uh, of COVID I think is going to be quite deep seated. So one is going to be labour, getting sufficient labour. Uh, the second is around supply chains. So in terms of uh, raw materials, resources, finished goods, uh, we will see bottlenecks uh, globally as uh, the system starts getting back to normal. And I think that is also the whole thing of COVID has thrown up uh, to people the awareness of having diversification in your supply chains and not having too much reliability on one, uh, one particular source of supply. You've got significant investment experience across a range of board roles and previous experiences that you've had. Reflecting on current business con conditions, take me through how you think companies are responding in terms of their investment appetite? The investment appetite, I think, is, is strong and, and we're going through you know, enormous change generally. There, there is the recovery post-COVID, but the underlying changes that were there previously around technology, 
uh, incredible uh, advances in uh, AI. All of those sort of changes have to provide enormous opportunities, but almost also great threats if people are not uh, prepared to, in a sense, disrupt their own business models in order to remain competitive. So I think we're going to be seeing that sort of change coming through, and that's a significant investment opportunity, and certainly in the companies I'm involved with, there's been significant investment into that. Modernization of logistics to, in a sense, come with that technological change uh, is very significant. And we've also seen a massive uh, increase in M&A. So people are out there seeing what opportunities there are to come together and, and realize benefits through that. And a massive wall of money around the world that's prepared to get behind it and, and back new investment opportunities. Before we move on, I'm interested to get your view on the long-term impacts of COVID from a corporate perspective, particularly in regard to long-term decision-making. I think what COVID has thrown up is the, the need to be alert to scenario planning, to the potential uh, for black swan events to come along. And we saw that sort of a decade ago with the GFC. And I think for many of us, when we saw COVID uh, first appear back in sort of, uh, or start affecting the economies back in February and March of, of 2020. Uh, many of us who have been through the GFC said, here we go again. Now, the interesting thing is it went quite differently. So if anyone had said in a very short period of time, basically the world would be locked down. Uh, we wouldn't be going to concerts. We wouldn't be going to art galleries. So we wouldn't be going to the office you would have said only six months previously, that is bizarre. If you had said, by the way, that is the scenario, what's going to come out of it, you would have said massive financial dislocation. And ironically, that hasn't happened because of the way governments have by and large responded around the world. So it just throws up the need to constantly be aware that these things can happen. And when they happen, they are quite different. You can't actually say, oh, we're going to have a black swan event and it's a type A black swan. You know, they are by definition completely different. And what that suggests is the need to be flexible, uh, the need to have management processes which are agile and where people can pivot very quickly uh, to respond to changing circumstances and mobilise the resources of the company uh, to respond. But there are things you can do in advance and I've mentioned already supply chain, where I think people had got into perhaps too much of a comfort zone around major supply from particular jurisdictions. So if you look at uh, the construction industry that then leases in most of the facade systems, the window systems, electrics um, to go into office buildings, apartments, come out of China. And what very quickly we identified was the need to have alternate sources of supply. Now, because we are such a massive global operator, we have you know, the ability to pivot quickly on supply, and that's happened. But also then to get ahead of the curve on supplies. So if you take Melbourne Metro, for example, which we're in the joint venture with Buig and John Holland, uh, massive requirement for steel. And that has been proving to be in, in short supply. So getting advanced deliveries of steel and, and building uh, stockpiles uh, so that you are insulated from any supply hiccups. And that's potentially another change that we're going to see going forward is, is the, the world of just-in-time manufacturing, uh, which has been so fantastic, pioneered by Toyota in, in the automotive sector. Is that now going to change, where people throughout the whole supply chain will be building up buffers, alternate areas of supply, uh, in order to cope with events like this in the future? Let's delve specifically into the Lendlease Corporation business. I'm interested to hear your view on how the business has adapted and changed over the past 10 or so years that you've been involved. It's uh, been a significant pivot to development and investment. So if you went back 10 years, very much uh, the sort of core heritage of the company was around the construction and then flowing off that into managing our own developments and, and, and the investment funds that come off that. 
but the pivot that's occurred over the last decade has been a far more focused approach into those development areas and into funds management. And the outcome of that has been this enormous pipeline that we now have globally, where we have over $110 billion of work secured in the development space, uh, diversified around the world, in the US, the UK, in Europe, uh, throughout Asia and here in Australia. And then what that does is provide a, um, a, a source of investment opportunities into our funds management platforms. And that, that is also supplemented by around 150 uh, capital partners that we have around the world, like the major pension funds, the major sovereign wealth funds, which uh, partner with us and allow us to bring these developments um, to, to reality. So I think that pivot into that uh, higher value end of development and investments has been probably the most significant change in terms of business model. And then in the last five years has been the focus on digital because our industry, the development and uh, construction industry has been one of the few that hasn't been disrupted yet by technology. If you think about fast moving consumer goods and, and the like, streaming services, you know, massive changes there. Our industry has been slow to respond. In part, that's because of the nature of the industry in the sense that so much is bespoke, is specific to a particular client need, but it will be disrupted at some stage. And the view we took as a board and with management uh, was we needed to be at the forefront of that disruption. So in the podium development uh, that we have um, under Bill Rue, there has been a significant progress made in the last five years in bringing uh, automated uh, capability into every aspect of the value chain for Lend Lease. But we're on a journey. There's still a way to go, uh, but as a board, we're right behind management in what they're doing in that space. Reflecting on the current environment, what are the key opportunities that Lend Lease sees on the horizon and how is the business positioning itself to capitalise on some of those growth opportunities? So specific uh, to Lend Lease is the opportunity embedded in $110 billion of work that we have around the world. And a key focus for us is how can we accelerate the delivery of that work? Some of those contracts go out to 2040, very long-term projects. Here we are in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne Quarter, a part of the whole Docklands scheme, which we, um, we were at the forefront of. That started in the 1990s. So these are long 20, 30 year developments in some cases, but the key thing is how can we accelerate the delivery of that pipeline? Very often the inhibiting factor is the time it takes to get planning approvals and the like. So what can one do to, to bring those forward? But by and large on average, lend -Lease in the past has delivered around $4 billion worth of product a year. And we are looking over the next three years to move that to $8 billion of product. Uh, so there in itself is a significant opportunity. And then that product, uh, working with our capital partners, fuels the growth in our investment platforms, which currently stand at around $40 billion of funds and assets under management. And we're looking to grow that to at least $70 billion um, over the next five years. So if you then overlay on that the opportunities around technology, uh, technology to speed up delivery, um, to make the delivery safer, because you do a lot more off-site and less working at height, to make it cheaper because it's more replicating of actions. There are all those benefits. And then probably the final opportunity, I'd say, is in the whole area of sustainability uh, which includes climate change and the like, which I think is a, is a phenomenal opportunity. The, the built environment is responsible for around about 40% of global emissions. And so clearly there is a massive opportunity if, to bring that down. And again, to go into that on a positive front and look at this as saying, this is an opportunity to add value both to the society and also to security holders. I think there are tons of really positive things ahead of us. 
Equally, what are the biggest challenges or risks that are being considered at a board level when you look to, ahead to the, the next three or four years of the business's future? A critical risk is around talent and both retaining the talent we have. Uh, Lend-Lease is a happy hunting ground for anybody in our industry. They, you will find Lend-Lease people are always on the short list for whatever role is there. Quite frankly, I see that as a really positive thing because it means you know we have a really strong bench. Uh, we are a really attractive organisation for people to come to and build careers. But clearly, one of the key things we want to do is make sure we keep a disproportionate share of our top talent. How we're going to grow that talent, uh, a constant question from investors is, Michael, you're looking to grow your production from 4 billion to 8 billion. What does that mean in terms of talent? Have you got the talent on the ground? Are you going to have to mobilise talent, which we are moving it around the world from where we have opportunities to uh, recruit people, etc. The whole thing around technology, uh, building that capability. So we now have technology hubs, not only in Sydney, but in Singapore with the support of the Singaporean government, because they are very interested in what we're doing in technology around how it can help them in affordable housing and also in Silicon Valley. And the whole thing around the sort of online uh, experience that we've seen through COVID actually gives us a lot more flexibility around where our talent can be based in order to uh, service our needs. In terms of lend current pipeline, take me through some of the landmark projects that are underway either domestically or internationally and what's driving the investment fundamentals behind these projects? Well, taking that last point first, which is a really key point you make there, Rob, which is around the appetite of capital investors around the world for prime property is unabated. And so the smart money is looking in what we call the gateway cities. So here in Australia, sort of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, et cetera, uh, London, uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, Milan, Singapore. There is still a great weight of the smart money in the sovereign wealth funds, in the large pension plans for prime property in those locations, which is why the cap rates are still so low. And so that is, um, plays right into our sweet spot because that's where our global pipeline of $110 billion um, has been uh, targeted. And then in terms of sort of iconic projects here in Australia, you look at something like Barangaroo, that's uh, in Sydney, sort of a 10, 15 year project, around about $10 billion worth of investment has gone into that primarily office, so that's around 280,000 square metres of offices, 1,000 odd apartments, uh, 18,000 square metres of retail, so that's the parameters there. Great sustainability credentials. So it was, I think, either the first or one of the first precinct, whole precinct in the world uh, to be carbon neutral. We have things like all of the um, heating, the air conditioning cooling is done through a technology that takes water out of Sydney Harbour, cycles it through to do the cooling, um, total recycling of, of water, etc. You look at somewhere in like uh, KL in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia with the TRX project there. That's a four or five billion dollar project we're doing. There is primarily retail. So it's coincidentally around 280,000 square metres of retail, another 1,000 plus, uh, I think 2,000 apartments, and a smaller amount of, um, of, of office space. In Milan, completely different there, on the site of the old Expo, which is a 100 hectare site, which is, we have the concession over that whole site. We're building uh, an innovation district with um, universities, teaching hospitals and technology innovation hubs and we've attracted interest not just through Europe but from around the world and whether that's in pharmaceuticals, in vaccine production, right through to high-tech industries um, an absolutely fascinating development that I think is going to be a real pathfinder for us uh, in the UK, Elephant Park 
anyone who knows south of London, the old Elephant and Castle was a, was a terrible place. And uh, now it is an absolutely fantastic urban regeneration. And one of the fascinating things there, which I think we can learn from in Australia, is that uh, around about 35% of the apartments there are affordable or social. And yet if you walk through that precinct, you wouldn't be able to pick which are the ones that were sold on the open market, which are affordable, which are social, because it's called tenure blind. And that's a real, I think, uh, forward looking approach to how we deal with this massive social issue of affordability in these gateway cities for housing, particularly for key workers. If you think of nurses, doctors, teachers, firemen, um, you know, we need them in our cities, but they can't afford to live there. And so I think governments, particularly here in Australia, need to do a lot more innovative thinking in that space. And then in the US, uh, we've recently announced a whole precinct block that we've acquired on the Brooklyn side of uh, the river in New York, partnering with Aware Super from here in Australia on a billion dollar project that's going to be delivering a very significant thousand apartment built to rent uh, opportunity. All of these precincts I've talked about, very high climate change, sustainability credentials, very high use of renewable energy, very high use of recycling techniques, etc. And the interesting thing is we've gone into that as part of our, uh, just our DNA at Lendlease. But actually that's incredibly attractive to investors because it's attractive to tenants. And it's attractive to tenants because it's attractive to staff and it's attractive to people to buy the apartments. And all of that thing is a virtuous circle which drives massive value and is doing the right thing in terms of the climate and environment. Speaking of investors, it was announced last year that the business is significantly increasing its real estate development activities to the tune of some $8 billion per year, whilst also looking to expand its fund management services or, or offering. Take me through the change in strategic direction, rather, and, and the drivers behind that decision. So this was part of that strategic pivot to uh, a very much a development-led focus and particularly on large-scale urban regeneration like we're sitting here in Melbourne, in Melbourne Quarter, and a, a park that's um, uh, one of the largest that's been built here in, in Melbourne in the last 50 or so years. So that urban regeneration in gateway cities and, and what we mean by gateway city is a city that's going to be very re resilient to any nature of change that comes down the track. So it's got a stable political environment, it's got strong growth pros prospects, uh, population growth, new economy, new technologies, etc. And so we have around 22 of those around the world that we've identified, and we have projects running in, in 10 or 12 of those gateway cities uh, currently. That's enabled us to build up this very significant pipeline of over $110 billion of projects around the world, and then accelerating the delivery of those projects, with very often planning being the inhibiting factor, and accelerating that so that we can increase our production from around $4 billion a year through to the $8 billion a year. And then that production provides the investment uh, assets where we partner with our strategic capital partners from around the world in building that funds management platform. So we bring in capital, but we manage 100% of the project. And so that's the sort of business model that we have. It's something that Len Lease has been doing for many, many years. But in the last 10 years, it's been a real focus of us to concentrate on where we have a clear competitive advantage globally, as demonstrated by winning that level of pipeline. And it also has a risk profile that matches what is our proposition to our security holders. As you know, the build to rent or multifamily sector is not a new sector overseas, but is relatively new here in Australia. What's your view on the emerging asset class here in Australia? And do you see that the fundamentals do stack up or is there a little bit of a way to go in terms of getting the planning and, and tax regimes in, in order? I think, Rob, there's still a way to go. So in the US, this is a very, very big sector. And if you stand back and say, uh, you know, what are the drivers of this? 
the ability for people to make choices about where they live and, and the nature of that living arrangement. So in Australia here, we're sort of very much in the past have been wedded to you buy, if you can, you buy your property, you start on the bottom of the property ladder, work your way up. But if you look in Europe, it's very, very common to, for people for their whole lives to be renting and they make other choices about whether they invest in equities, whether they have particular passions around collecting things, whether they just, it's around having a good lifestyle. And similarly in the US, that is a very common approach, which is to, to rent. The difference in the US and the uh, Europe is the ability to get long-term security of tenure. So people can make a, a lifestyle choice that I'm going to rent rather than buy, but they can have security of tenure where they know that they can be in this property for the next 10, 15, 20 years. The problem in Australia is that by and large, uh, tenure is based on one year leases and uh, people can come back, whether it's from overseas or wherever it is, want to move back into their home and then you've got to go and find something else. So that's the background to build to rent. It's, it's, it's responding to people's legitimate lifestyle choices. In the US, where this has been developed as a massive asset class, the, that is very attractive to large-scale investors. So uh, taking an entire block of apartments, so maybe 500 apartments, 600 apartments, owned by the one investment, quite often a pension fund, and they are getting off that strong annuity style earnings because they have a whole property there which has got a whole range of tenants who are paying regular rentals. What it provides also to the tenants is not only security of tenure but incredible uh, facilities. So in terms of gyms, swimming pools, I visited uh, one that we've built in, in Chicago uh, called the Cooper and there's a whole floor of the apartment building dedicated to uh, common facilities, some of which you can use all the time, some of which you have to book. There's a library, there's a great big games room. Uh, you go up on the roof of the building, there is a commercial chef's kitchen, which you can book, so you don't have to pay for it, but you do have to book it. You can either then entertain 10, 20 of your guests there, either cooking yourself or getting a chef in from the outside. There's cinemas, so incredible facilities which you can't imagine here in Australia. So, Michael, why isn't this happening here? The issue here is firstly around the structure of our market. So the fact that there are so many individuals who own investment properties. So they, uh, in a sense, drive down the returns that can be achieved in this market. How are they driven down? Well, because the value of the properties are so high here in Australia. So the rental yield, typically what people are getting is two, three, four percent. The rental yield they would expect to get in built to rent in the US is nine, ten percent or higher. And then you've got a whole lot of tax impositions uh, around property taxes here, GST and the like, which take away from those returns. So I think it will come here in Australia. I think the people who are doing it today are really testing the market, seeing what it's going to take to get it off the ground. But there will have to be some give in a range of areas for it to become the size of asset class that it is in the US and increasingly in the UK. So in London, we have two of our uh, buildings at Elephant Park, for example, are going to be built to rent and in a number of the other developments we're looking at, it's, um, they're built to rent as well. So ironically, Lendlease has this significant exposure globally, and here we're, we're still testing the market. In fact, one of the buildings coming up here in Melbourne Quarter, there is very active consideration as to do we make that a build to rent, and again, sort of test and learn about what it's going to take in this market to get it off the ground. Now, no doubt you've been asked this ad nauseum over recent months, but I still have to ask you the question, what's your view or the business's view on the future of office? Great question, Rob. And uh, if only we had a crystal ball. Um, my starting position on this, uh, I'll give you a personal perspective than, than the sort of what I would call the house view. 
So my personal perspective is you go back through human history over thousands of years and there have been discontinuities called by us famine, war, pestilence, plague as we've currently had. And the interesting thing is after that, human nature is such that people want to gather, they want to gather face to face. It's the fact that we're doing this interview face to face as opposed we could easily do it online but there's just something different about human beings interacting in the way we are. And therefore cities have always come back into the fore, notwithstanding what's gone on in the past. So my personal view is that the role of the city, whether that's around innovation, whether that's around just social interaction, cultural interaction, uh, galleries, concerts, whether it's sporting, etc will keep the vibrancy of, of the human nature fueled. And so I'm a strong believer, and you would say, Rob, well, you would say that because you're chairman of a company that builds cities. But I'm very confident that that will come back. What the house view is, and of course, we've got exposure around the world, and we, uh, the team, executive team, have done a lot of work in this space, is that it is still emerging how things will settle down, but we are beginning to see trends. So you ask about offices. In the offices, um, there was a push for flexibility before COVID. So Lend-Lease very much uh, was encouraging flexible working for the last five, 10 years. What COVID has done is to cement the fact that that is a practical alternative. And what we're seeing is that people are looking to increase the amount of flexibility that they have, potentially uh, settling on something like three days in the office, three or four days, and the other one to two days being flexible, which may be working from home for a lot of young people, particularly if they're living in shared accommodation, for example, that is actually quite tough, but maybe in satellite offices, in, in hubs or whatever it may be. But a lot of employers are saying that we thrive on innovation and teamwork and it's incredibly hard to build a culture uh, to build values if you're trying to do that over the online uh, video capability but on the other hand there are people looking for flexibility and one of the phrases we use is employers will need to earn the commute they will need to create an environment where people think it is worth their while spending half an hour or an hour or an hour and a half commuting and then from the employee's point of view, I think a lot of people are missing the social interaction. And so those two things, I think, will come together around uh, preserving the importance of offices, but they will need to change. They will need to be spaces of uh, lots of flexible space, uh, space for collaboration, for teamwork, for innovation, the ability to reconfigure. And then what we're starting to hear from our clients is absolutely people are still taking out long-term leases in our office developments, but they're wanting more flexibility. They're potentially wanting flex space. So we'll take a lease on six floors, but we want a guaranteed arrangement with you that there are another two floors that we can flex into and flex out of if we have to. And in Singapore, under our, our CEO, Tony Lombardo, when he was running our Asian business, uh, we were starting to build offices there that had um, significant flex capability because we could see that coming pre-COVID. So what COVID has done is accelerated a lot of these trends around flexibility, but I don't think in any way has it destroyed uh, the rationale for, for offices. We've done a similar piece of work around what it means for residential and that ties off the office piece because if people are going to have more flexibility and uh, be it working from home for one or two days a week or maybe more, then they need capacity at home to be able to work in an appropriate environment. So they're starting to, the trend of smaller and smaller apartments, uh, and we're seeing this already in Asia, is now going back the other way where people are wanting a dedicated office space they're going to be wanting space to do their exercise, to do their yoga, whatever it may be. They want actually to be in an environment. They're far more now interested 
in the public spaces around where, because they're spending more time at home, suddenly having green space to go and exercise is more important. So it's also, there's a correlation in changing the shape of the residential component. I thought we'd close out our discussion with a few topical issues of the day at the moment, in particular with the push toward net zero by 2050. How would you assess Australia's competitive positioning relative to the rest of the world? I'd say it's almost schizophrenic because we, we live in a, a fabulous nation where every state and territory has laid out commitments to net zero effectively around 2050 or earlier. And so in New South Wales, in Victoria, they're bringing those commitments further forward. We have a corporate environment where companies like Len Lease have been focused on sustainability forever and a day. Last year announced our latest targets in this space, which is net zero for scope one and two emissions by 2025. So we're not talking 2050, but scope one, two, 2025. And for all three scopes, absolute zero by 2040. And we know exactly how we're going to get to our 2025 goals. The goals for 2040, which are very ambitious, uh, will require new uh, technological solutions, which is interestingly very much what our Prime Minister has been talking about recently in Canberra. What we found is having put out ambitious targets at Len Lease, we are being approached by any number of people around things like zero carbon steel, low uh, carbon concrete, hydro treated vegetable oil in the UK, which replaces diesel and takes out 90% of the emissions that come from diesel. So a whole lot of new technologies, I think when you make commitments like that, you attract like a magnet people can see you as an opportunity to develop these technologies. And then at the individual front in Australia, we have one of the largest take-ups in the world of renewable energy through solar. And yet, if you viewed us externally with all of the political narrative that's been going on, you could be forgiven for thinking we're a country of Luddites who don't believe in climate change. So. I find that a very sort of curious, and that's why I say schizophrenic view of the world, because climate change is real. It's coming at us like a steam train. Australia, in, in a practical sense, has responded very comprehensively and well ahead of many of the other players in the world. And it's a massive opportunity. And so I think that's the approach we have at Len Lease. I think that's the approach we should have as a, as a nation and the um, people are already talking about opportunities with uh, hydrogen. Uh, if you look at rare earths for the powering of lithium batteries and the like, you know, all areas where we have as a nation a competitive advantage. And I'm so pleased that we've finally got to a stage where we now have that sort of uniform narrative, I hope, coming out from Australia about we are actually right behind this and we are going to deliver. And that's one of the great things around Australia. We just, when we say we do something, we get on and do it. I want to ask you about company culture. How do you create it and what are the important components that are required to ensure staff are engaged and performing at the highest possible level, particularly given that Lendlease, I think, has at last count some 13,000 employees across the world? Yeah, culture is absolutely fundamental. Culture and values and what you stand for as a company is what allows you to drive sustainable value for shareholders and security holders. Fundamental to culture is your purpose. So what is it you stand for as a company? Why do you exist as a company? And in the case of Lend Lease, what we stand for is we create places together where communities thrive. It's very simple and it's a very important role that we have in society. By establishing that as our purpose, people know why they work for us, and they know from the outside why they would want to join us as an organisation, and the people who deal with us know that's our purpose. And from that, you can then drive the culture and what you stand for as an organisation. 
and then that culture has to be driven from the top. It has to be driven from the way the CEO behaves because it doesn't matter what people say, people look at what you do, it's the, so the behaviour of the CEO, the executive team and indeed the board. So we, in a sense, are the standard bearers uh, for the culture and so having established that purpose, having established the values, what we expect uh, our people to do and what we expect of ourselves, that then drives the culture and that has to per pervade everything you do. So the way you deal with one another, the way you deal with your customers, the way you deal with your suppliers, the way you deal with regulators, government, it has to be ruthlessly consistent and then that builds on itself. So it has to infect every decision you take. What are the key skill sets that a successful company director needs in this changing environment and how have you seen those skills that are required change over the course of your career? Personally, I think a critical skill set is that ability to come to the boardroom with an objective frame of mind and be prepared to listen to different points of view, whether that's from executive management or whether that's from your colleagues around the board table. I've been involved in, on the board of four major public companies in the last 25 years and to me that is the critical thing you need to bring to the table. It's actually a very hard thing for many people to bring to the table who have had very senior executive roles in the past. Uh, so I was Deputy Chief Executive at National Australia Bank, so you're used to people sort of A, expecting you to have a view and listening to your view and then when you've expressed your view, doing it. But if you've got eight people sitting around the table with that background and very often you know, companies say that what they're looking for is people with senior executive experience, well you've got a lot of people who've got a view. And so coming to that boardroom with an objective frame of mind, a preparedness to listen and also Rob something I try to do is I may have a personal view that there is a particular way of solving a problem. But if management comes to the table with a passionate approach, with a different perspective, even though I may think, actually, I think there's, there's a better way, but I can understand where they're coming from and I think they will get there as well. It's that preparedness in, mo in many cases, not always, but in many cases to say, okay, we'll let you run with that uh, because they're going to believe in it. The worst thing you want is management walking out of the room saying, we don't actually think this is the right way to go, but the board has told us, you know, you know you're almost guaranteeing failure. So I'm not saying in every instance you, you don't dig your heels in and say, no, on this matter, we're going to do it this particular way. But bringing that objectivity, a preparedness to listen, a preparedness to take tough decisions, I mean, when you've got a problem, it doesn't get any easier by letting it fester. So take the tough decision, take it early. I think those are some of the, the critical things that you need to bring to the table as a, a non-executive. You asked, Rob, what, um, what has changed? I think public expectations of, of directors has changed. And, and you've seen that most recently in, in the Royal Commissions uh, that we've had into various industries how often the focus is almost entirely on the board and not on the executive management. And if you went back 15, 20 years, you would see that the board are actually almost in the background and it's executive management in the foreground. But now public expectations are, you sit around the board table and particularly in the role as, as I have as chairman, you should be across every major thing that's happening in the company. And I happen to think that's a fair expectation. And what it has meant is directors and particularly chairmen commit far more time to the roles than they did in the past. And I think that's a good thing. I think where the expect, there is an expectation gap is that no individual, particularly in a company, as you mentioned, with many thousands of employees and operations around the world, can be, be aware of everything that happens. But what you do have to be conscious of is once something happens that's gone wrong, and it's significant that you hear about it very quickly, 
and that you respond appropriately. My final question is reflecting on your career and as I mentioned in the opening, you've had such a diverse array of career experiences. What are your proudest achievements and what does the next chapter look like for you? I think my proudest achievements would be that both in an executive roles and also now as a non-executive, I've been able to bring to the table the concerns I have around social justice and the environment generally and have those concerns become relevant to large corporations that have the capacity to make a difference and to make that difference in a sustainable way and also in a way that delivers value for shareholders and for employees. Because there's no, I don't believe in vanity projects and the like, I think that's a complete abuse of, of, of um, authority but opening the eyes uh, of corporate organisations to, for example, disadvantage in education, legitimately using the resources of the organisation to make a difference in that space. How does that add value? Well, it adds value because it builds um, the culture within the organisation. It builds the belief that people have within the company and there's any amount of evidence that you get more productivity you get better engagement with customers. It then builds your brand externally with customers, with society generally, with regulators, etc. And we've seen how important that is, particularly in the last five years through Royal Commissions and the like. And then that builds long-term value for shareholders. So if I think back, there have been some you know, very large programs that, that I've had a, a hand in bringing those to life within organisations and it's in a sustainable way. And that's something I reflect on and think I've been so lucky to be in a position where I've been able to do that. Michael Ulmer, AO, a pleasure speaking with you this morning. Thanks for your time and your insights. Thank you, Rob.